guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 158, featuring the second part of my interview with game audio maestro Dave Warhol. In this part of the interview, we focus in on game audio, including some of the scores he did for some of my favorite games, including a certain CRPG I'm rather fond of. And we also talk about the Nintendo Entertainment System and all of the shenanigans that Dave had to deal with to get Maniac Mansion produced for that system. A lot of great stuff, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Warhol. Right, Dave, let's talk about music. Yeah, you're the you composed uh, one of my favorite scores uh, for one of my favorite games of all time, Pool of Radiance. I was doing a little math a while ago, and I figured out that I I first played this game when I was 11 years old, and I remember the first time I booted it up. You know, the title screen comes up, and your song uh, comes on. I remember uh, I didn't press the space bar. You know, because I wanted to, you know, I was like, whoa, this is great. You know, I had to listen to the whole, you know, piece all the way through. And now it's been something like almost 25 years later. And I can still hum, you know, the whole, <laughs> the whole piece. Right. Uh, you know, how do you do something like that? Oh, well, thanks. The, um, um, for a couple of years after, after uh, Intellivision went, the INTV Corporation went out of business and I was doing a lot of music and sound effects for electronic arts. Um, I, I was just like a, I was a independent music uh, contractor and, you know, my name got out there a little bit with, with people in the community. And so, um, the guys at SSI, uh, got in touch with me and asked me if I would, uh, do the, the music and sounds. And, um, um, <clears throat> I mean, technically I would just create a driver that would, uh, sit in their address space and then write the data. And there was no MIDI devices at that time. So I was pretty much composing at a keyboard and then, and then writing it into data statements and compiling and listening to it and make sure that it was working. And then stylistically, uh, that, you know, it's, it's, it's probably my favorite thing that I've ever done for games as well. Um, I wanted to be in the style of Wagner. Uh, and so um, just kind of got my head in that space. And there's actually, uh, um, there's, Two measures that are a, a deliberate quote from Siegfried, the opera Siegfried, uh, probably the first, you know, the opening, the opening um, uh, movement, uh, the overture to that. So uh, anyway, it was it was it was a blast, and uh, um, yeah, it just it, you know, it, I'm I'm glad it was in this RPG because you know I was able to kind of get out there, and and you know we didn't have we didn't have a lot of scores at the time, of course. Because I was not an embedded part of the team, we were only played at the beginning, or you know maybe I don't know if they excerpted it for different things. If had I been working with them in a you know in a in a closer basis, maybe we would have been able to interleave music throughout the game. Uh, but uh, you know back then it was just the title songs that we were doing. Yeah, that would have been great to have uh, combat songs. Uh, yeah. yeah, in um, I think it was an adventure construction set. I'd written a bunch of music, but then I broke it up into smaller pieces. So that you could call at any time in the adventure you made an appropriate uh, musical phrase or piece. You also did the music for the Bard's Tale uh, games, right? Bard's Tale one and two. Uh, so I was thinking, I wonder if it's okay uh, to call you the original Bard. <laughs> that would be, I would be, uh, I would be honored. Uh, I, I, you know, I did. I think I did a lot or most of them, but um, memory doesn't serve correct if I did. You know, all of them were all the platforms. Um, um, and uh, there I was trying to write medieval music, uh, you know, trying to make it sound of the period. And uh, so this is where, you know, kind of going to going to school for music help uh, was, you know, trying to keep the musical devices appropriate for the era. And in the Bard's Tale 2, I had a classmate of mine, Aaron Abbey, help with some of the compositions. Uh, and then I would arrange them. And, you know, a lot of the games that I did music for, um, I did work with other composers who would help create, who would write the songs. Uh, and then uh, usually I would take those songs and then arrange them for the platform uh, and, and and get them out there. So I didn't really write all of the music that I did, like Pool of Radiance. Yeah, that one I wrote. But like the Maniac Mansion stuff, which we might talk about, uh, that was all the Batman and his crew. 
and, and Dave Hayes, another very talented guy uh, up in uh, Pasadena. Um, and but but I was kind of producing and then mixing and uh, arranging uh, their stuff for the platform. So you'd mentioned uh, race, racing destruction sets come up a couple of times. Or the, did you uh, just work on the audio with that? It's, uh, you also did some of the design work or development work with that game. Right? I I probably was just in the audio. Uh, maybe you know I might have been playing the game with Rick while he was developing it and giving him suggestions. But but um, that was uh, that was pretty much just a uh, an audio contribution. And that was a pretty clear. That was an ex Mattel crew. Uh, Rick Koenig, brilliant programmer, awesome programmer. Connie, awesome graphics of the you know of the day. Uh, they had even invented a you know if Connie worked on something, they, Mattel had a brand called Super Graphics. And all it really meant was, oh, Connie worked on it, um, and then uh, and then I was doing the audio. So it was it was an, an ex and, and Don Daglo at Electronic Arts uh, produced that um, for Commodore 64, and I'm not sure what other platforms it got onto. Did you also work with uh, Dan Button uh, or Daniel uh, Button Barry? Yes. yes, yes, I was honored to work with uh, Dan Danny, um, brilliant brilliant designer, great great team leader, and this was like we were working remotely most of the time. Of uh, uh, you know, I probably did three or four games for uh, for Danny, um, maybe yeah, uh, Heart of Africa, Robot Rascals. Um, uh, there was a command. There's there some yeah, a few a few different ones. Um, but but Danny was great to work with. You know, we'd be sitting on the phone. Uh, I would send out a build of sound effects, and then we'd be sitting on the phone. It was like. I don't know, a little bit more like this, a little more like, it, there's just something about the way that we work together that, you know, instead of saying, this is great, this is horrible, he really was able to kind of get me to contribute from a distance like I was part of the team. Very, uh, very social, very personable in that regard. Um, uh, I learned a lot of things about game design um, from Dan, Danny, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, terrific a uh, tremendous loss for the industry, um, but uh, an inspiration to everybody. Um, a real, real pleasure to work with. You also, one of the more interesting games uh, from a musical standpoint uh, was certainly Loom. I remember that one. Uh, so you worked right. with uh, George Sanger, aka the Fat Man, on this, and uh, you know several other folks. But what was you know, this? Is a musical game, you know? So what's the, what was your involvement like with this? Right. Um, well, this was while. Um, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of music contracting, and I had uh, been doing some work for Lucasfilm Games at the time. It wasn't called LucasArts, it was Lucasfilm Games. I'd done a PC version of their Zach McCracken or something like that, kind of got to know the crew. Um, and so when they were doing Loom, they asked me if I wanted to do that. They didn't have an in-house audio department at the time, um, and so I was, you know, glad to do whatever I could for them. And uh, got to know Brian Moriarty. And then he kind of told me his vision of the game, that he wanted the music from Swan Lake. And and I was going, Swan Lake, come on, write some original music. Come on, let's not do Swan Lake. And he was like, nope, 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 want Swan Lake. And boy, was he right. You know, that was just, you know, that, that was great. Um, so, um, so this is one where um, I used my technology and uh, did some arrangements. And at, at that time, there were like one or two PC cards, the size, the PC single speaker, um, I had some nice technology that sounded pretty good on that, but they also had the ad lib board and the sound blaster board, and that's when it was like, this is the the, the market is getting too um, seg uh, segmented in order to actually take advantage of arranging for the hardware. You know, when they had different octave ranges and things like that, I, as a musician, I wanted to customize the musical experience for the hardware, but there were so many different um, pieces of hardware and so few tools, it was really hard to exploit. Um, but, and then the third one was the MT32, which was the high-end Yamaha PC synthesizer. Uh, and so that's where I, I went to George and asked him if he would do the arrangements for the MT32 version, which he totally nailed. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so it's kind of my technology and then working with a couple of other people on the outside, bring that all together. Kind of an aside, but something that's always puzzled me about game audio uh, composers and musicians. You know, I talked to uh, George a little bit about this too. It's just to, to me, it would make sense that if you really want to be great uh, with game audio, then you need to learn the, the hardware part of it, right? The, the code, how the you know how the the software and the hardware interact, and all these sort of peculiarities of the technology. And surely that would have some effect on the creativity 
uh, the composition, right? But, but it seems like every uh, professional I've talked to though says, no, you know, you can be creative on anything. You know, it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, what, what, what do, you, do you think there's a relationship between the, the composition and the te whatever the technology is that you're working with? Um, I, I, I do probably, if you think about it in terms of pre-MIDI and post-MIDI, uh, MIDI is this technology that enabled a lot of uh, non-technical uh, musicians to just be able to, you know, record their performances, which could then be played back. And uh, if you think about it before MIDI, I think that you had to understand the technology in order to make the most out of the machine. I mean, that's just what I did was um, look at the hardware, look at the, the you know, the ranges of, of pitches that the machines would offer, uh, the, the waveforms, and, and, and then knowing the assembly language code, I was able to optimize, you know, I would write some music and then I might modify my driver because I knew that I was only using four octaves, so I would use five bits instead of six bits to describe a, uh, you know, a note or a note stream or something like that. So, so that's how I was able to get so much music into so little space. I mean, uh, uh, so I would say, you know, in the, back in the day, you really had to know the technology in order to exploit it. And, you know, post MIDI, one of the reasons I stopped doing music uh, myself is that is that I'm, I'm not a very fluid composer. I know how to write a song, but I just don't sit down with a guitar and, and start jamming. And with MIDI, we were able to capture the performances of you know uh, much more prolific musicians. And so I kind of saw that as, as when I started to move into producing games more than just producing the audio for games, um, because we could get uh, other talents in the, the industry. And, and nowadays, because you're using MP3s or uh, coded, you know, uh, you know, all you need to do is be great in a music studio and you can, um, you can do that. So, and if you look at a lot of, you know, a lot of licensed music, you know, you need to be just a straight ahead, you know, rock musician who knows their way around a studio in order to, you know, the technology of a studio and not necessarily the technology of video games. Now, that being said, if you want to do interactive music, then you do need to really understand that technology. And that's why studios like Harmonix that specialize in music, uh, you know, music heavy games, They've got a, a bunch of understanding about how those things can cut up and, and work together. So there's still a there's still a need to understand technology in the musicianship of games. It just depends on the the nature of the game, I guess, and the platform you're working on. Yeah, this is you know I think I'll just always be sad about this development with the, I mean because for me the, it's really exciting to think about guys in there with the technology and creating new kinds of sounds with this stuff and you know that's what's really fascinating to me. I mean I, I can listen to a CD, you know. <laughs> I can turn on the radio. We got that. You know, I want to hear something new. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, all the big the big franchises have their own composers, um, and you know, to whatever degree, I know that Lucas uh, Lucasfilm Games and Lucas Arts eventually uh, Michael Land went on to create this iMuse system that was highly interactive, where an animation might stop until the music got to a certain point, and then both would proceed together. You know. Uh, uh, I'm sure it was very dramatically effective and, and all of that, but, you know, it's kind of like the market voted and with the dollars. And so, you know, people like playing Grand Theft Auto and they're just switching a radio station and listening to the hits from the 80s rather than, you know, but even then nobody could afford to write 50 hours of music for a, uh, for a, for a game anymore. So, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm drawn towards music you know, kind of heavily music integrated uh, gameplay. Um, but, you know, there's there's a place for that too. I think there's a small school of us that, you know, coming back to Pool of Radiance for a second, you know, there, there are certain people I think that would listen to that and think, oh, this would be so much better if it was redone with, you know, a real orchestra and everything. But I'm like, no, I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. the way it sounds, it wouldn't be the same. Yeah, I would love to orchestrate that, honestly. Uh, but then I'd end up with like a, an orchestral work that's a one minute and 28 seconds long. <laughs> so I'd have, yeah. to, I'd have to exaggerate it somewhat. I don't know if you remember working on the, the track to FA-18 Interceptor. Yeah, yeah. You know, this was, I, I think I owe you a couple bucks for this one because I actually, you know, I'd boot this up and I finally figured out how to record it onto a cassette tape and I brought it to school and sold it, you know, sold a few copies. So. Yay! <laughs> All right. No, no, that's fine by me. <clears throat> that's fantastic. Um, that one was the first one that it, where I actually recorded my synthesizer rig and played it back as a WAV file instead of trying to synthesize 
or you know use the hardware for um, sounds. Uh, there was a there was another. I, I would say probably one of my least favorite projects I worked on was uh, Rick Koenig's second racing game for the Amiga, and that's where I tried to do a real time FM synthesis where I was building waveforms using FM technology in advance of their uh, being noticed. And, and it, it really didn't work out very well. And I think the arrangement suffered for that. So when I got a chance to do the FA-18, I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna record something that sounds cool and then we'll play it back in loops and stuff like that. And then specifically, we were looking at Top Gun and, um, and at the opening of Top Gun, before you get the Kenny Loggins, if that is really heavy thing when he takes off, it's kind of dawn on the carrier and you hear this kind of, you know, this, ominous music and you know so that's what we that's what we went for and it's, it's kind of interesting because it's kind of like a mellow jet fighter game because we never got into the kenny loggins part afterwards with it with it with a high high-handed rock and stuff um but uh, but yeah yeah it was a, that was a lot of fun to do well, in 1986, you founded the uh, real time associates of which you're still the president still active still an active uh, company so the longest standing, this is from the website, uh, the longest standing independent interactive entertainment studio in operation today with over 100 uh, commercial titles. So what, why did you found uh, Real Time Associates? Um, well, uh, I'll have to say it's going to be one of the longest standings because I believe um, like another Mattel alumni, uh, Bill Fisher, Quicksilver Software, he's out there um, plugging away as well. Um, uh, but uh, a lot of times people who found these studios will get uh, purchased by a larger publisher or, you know, we'll kind of run their course, start another thing. So, yeah, we have been operating continuously since the, the late 80s. Um, but I think I've, I found it to take advantage of a business opportunity. Um, uh, having having really, you know, like eight years, maybe six to eight years of professional game development experience and working with a lot of the ex-Mattel crew in this uh, group of contractors that were doing uh, uh, Intellivision games and all that, um, uh, I, I had a lot of expertise, and it was really easy for us to hop onto the 8-bit Nintendo, the 16-bit systems, because um, because we had a lot of uh, of, of, of um, technical know-how. And so I founded Real-Time Associates to be able to create more games than just I was able to produce and uh, that I was able to program or, or contribute to. And and what we found was because we had such a robust tool set, we had level editors, we had graphics tools that allowed people to see what they're, you know, they'd be working in D-Paint, but they could see on the platform the, the very artwork that they were drawing. Uh, we had such uh, good tools that were allowing entry-level entry level people to be so prolific, we grew very quickly. Um, and so Real-Time Associates was, you know, to, 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 uh, to you, know, take, you know, take advantage of the fact that we were, at that time, there were very few studios that were offering uh, game development services for uh, publishers, third, you know, third-party studios. There's probably there are a handful of them, but not a lot. One of the titles you know, that you did, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, is uh, Maniac Mansion, the NES NES version of that, ah, uh, which yeah. has really great music. You know, <laughs> yeah. no coincidence. Uh, so I was just wondering about that game and you know, sort of the experience of that. And then also, I don't know if you were involved uh, with the changes that Nintendo wanted uh, from the original game. So oh yeah. Sort of two kind of topics. But could you cover those? Yeah, um, well, because of my work with audio in Lucasfilm or Lucasfilm Games, um, uh, and you know they knew I was doing uh, a bit Nintendo work as well. Um, they, uh, I guess, uh, Maniac Mansion had been originally released in Japan, but it had been completely reprogrammed, and so it was. It did not have that feel of the Scum system, the the text adventure games or the uh, graphic adventure games that you know Lucas uh, had made this engine that had like Zack McCracken, Loom, you know, so many games were done in it, um, but the Japanese version um, just wasn't programmed that way. So Jalico, the publisher of, of, um, of Maniac Mansion on the 8-bit Nintendo, approached Lucasfilm and said they wanted a you know, very faithful rendition of it. So that meant we had to create a scum interpreter on the 8-bit Nintendo so that we could take the original code. So it really is running all of the scripts that Ron Gilbert originally made, all of the puzzles, they're, we're, we're coding or decoding them. All of the graphics that they originally did for the Commodore 64, and we repurposed to make sure that the colors matched on boundaries and stuff like that. So it was a very faithful port of the, um, of the PC 
or excuse me, of the um, probably the Commodore 64. Um, very tough technology. David Stifel was the programmer on that who did the uh, interpreter. Uh, great job there. There's still a little, there's a little flicker at the video sync where we're resetting the, you know, resetting the frame buffer that we're, I don't think we're ever able to get out of. At least I see that in the emulator, so I'm not sure how pronounced that was in the cartridges. Um, so there were a couple of rough edges, but, you know, to pull off a, a big game like that, plus cram it into this tiny little cartridge, plus have all that music. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a great, great project. Um, uh, the guys that, you know, we collaborated with the guys at Lucas on it. They were doing a lot of the the scripts that had to be modified. They were they were working on that, and we kind of did the technology, and music, and, and all that. But yeah, it's a it's definitely one of our our, our uh, you know one of the most pronounced titles, I'd say. Oh, as far as music goes, the music, the music though, um, we got about three quarters of the way through the project, and the guy from Jalico goes, "Great, where's the music?" And we're going, "What music? There's no music in the original." He says, "Well, Nintendo games can't not have music. You can't have dead silence." You know, where's the music? And so this was probably my first, the first time that I ever did a contract amendment, which was like, uh, we didn't sign up to do any music. Okay, here's some more money. Let's do some music. Um, and then that's when I got uh, two composers involved. Well, George and his crew, uh, Team Fat. And then I also reached out to um, Dave Hayes, a uh, jazz funk fusion keyboardist out here in Pasadena, um, uh, who, uh, and between the Team Fat and, um, and Dave, uh, probably got eight and maybe 10, 12 songs written. Um, they were all doing about MIDI, but you know, knowing the constraint of the hardware and then sending them to me. And then I was tweaking them to work with the drivers, uh, picking out the right voices and doing some arranging uh, of it and, uh, and, um, and going from there. So yeah, there was a, there's a lot of music that I really like in that, in that, uh, in that volume. Um, uh, Do you have a favorite track from it? Or favorite uh, song? A few of them. There's one called CompuNerd, which is just kind of like, uh, it's uh, one of um, uh, Joe McDermott's songs from Team Fat, I think he did it. And it's the it's the nerd character in Maniac Mansion, and it kind of has a rhythm, but it's not, you know, it's kind of almost there. Um, there's a punk rock theme that, uh, we didn't have names for the songs until after the project was over. We had to give them all names. And there's a punk rock girl who was like, nah, 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 nah. and her song, I liked it for the name. We called it, no, no, never, never. Well, maybe sure, okay. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, Dave Hayes did um, uh, the heroes, the, the main heroes theme, uh, which which is kind of based on that song, The Boys Are Back. And we called that one, The Boys Are Still Back. And if you listen to the soundtrack, you can probably figure out which songs I'm talking about for, for each of those. All right, so you had mentioned that Nintendo wanted you to make some changes. Oh yeah, uh, from the original game. Why do they want you to make changes? Yeah, there, there were well, you know, Nintendo had they were very family friendly, and and you know the original games, the PC games, you know, C sixty four wasn't made for six year olds, eight year olds, ten year olds, whereas the eight bit Nintendo really kind of was. Um, so there weren't really any clear standards. Nintendo had some standards, and and this game, Maniac Mansion, Lucasfilm had adhered to all of the standards. But once the game was released, they, um, well, once it was released and people were playing it, they were like, oh, my God, you put a hamster in a microwave oven? <laughs> we can't do that. That is so anti. And so there were a number of, of things that we had to come up with a re-release uh, to cover the, uh, you know, to cover the changes that Nintendo needed. Um, one of them was a statue. It was a, a statue. But because of the colors of the pixels, it looked like it was nude, and they were saying, oh, we can see the pubic area there. And it says, no, that's a pixel. That's a black pixel. <laughs> no, no, no. no. So uh, there was a bug that was introduced because of that. We had a control panel um, that was, we didn't want to be active in the game, so we hid it behind the statue. We turned it invisible and hid it behind the statue. According to Scum, you could never interact with it. Okay, but then once we had to remove that statue, this invisible control panel was still there. And we didn't realize it in the testing. So I think there's a bug where if you go to where the statue used to be and start poking around, you can get a you can hit a control panel that will just blow up the whole mansion or something like that. <laughs> so uh, you know, but you know, it's all in good fun. You know, I didn't mind revving the ROMs or anything like that. The pubic bug. No. A pixel. A pixel. P the pubic pic pixel. Yeah. Uh, so did you feel like uh, Nintendo was in the wrong, you know, for asking for these changes or? Did you agree with them? 
Um, I didn't mind one way or the other. You know, I knew that <clears throat> I, I wasn't offended by the fact that these things had to be taken out. I thought it was kind of amusing. But if you look back at it, you know, they knew what they were doing. They didn't want angry parents saying, you've got a new statue that my six-year-old is looking at. You know, they're, they're um, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I appreciate why they did, you know, I, why they why they asked uh, what they did. I had a number of other Nintendo titles that got kicked out of QA for references, um, uh, for, you know, references to smoking uh, cigarettes. For example, we had a, in the Rocketeer, we had a Bulldog Cafe, which is a location, and it's this big bulldog, and it is smoking a corn cob pipe, but it's a water barrel, you know, this enormous water barrel. So we just had it as a scene, an establishing shot for a scene, and they said, oh, you got to get rid of that uh, because it's, it's uh, you know, it's a smoking reference. I was like, no, 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 that's a historical landmark, and it actually has this corn cob thing. It's, a, it's an architectural thing. Nope, nope, nope. So you got to get, got to get rid of that. But uh, but then just to get back for them, get back at them, I think in the same rev, oh no, it was a Dick Tracy game, Dick Tracy game, where we had a hemline on Madonna and it got approved. And then when we did a rev, I went in and lowered her hemline by one pixel just to, just to give them grief, see if they would notice. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the third and final part of my interview with Mr. Warhol. And after that, there will be a retrospective. So remember, guys, if you want me to uh, review a game of your choice, then record a, a 10 to 30 second clip uh, telling me about the game and why you like it so much. Uh, send that to me in a link, and if I go with that game, I will include that clip in with the retrospective. Should be lots of fun. I'm really looking uh, forward to what you guys come up with. So uh, good luck. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing your videos. Now, as always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. I had a very uh, generous donation last week from Jake from Seattle. So thanks, uh, Jake. And thanks to everyone who has been keeping this show going. It really means a lot to me, guys. So uh, remember, you can go to armchairarcade.com, uh, armchairarcade.com, click the Matt Chat link, and you can make a one-time donation or do a subscription. Either way, it's very much appreciated. All right, now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I've got... This week, I've got a Tommyknocker Jack Whacker Wheat Ale. Apparently, this is the, quote, uh, perfect refreshment for a thirsty, trail-weary ale lover. <laughs> I don't know if you can uh, tell from my voice, but I've been kind of hoarse uh, today from... Went to a rock fest uh, last week and got to see Iron Maiden for the first time, as well as Alice Cooper, Seven Dust, and Papa Roaches. A really great time, but I was screaming, <laughs> as you can imagine, so <coughs> uh, forgive the voice. Uh, maybe this will help. Uh, anyway, let's get it open and uh, see what the Jack Whacker is all about. Oh, here we go. I got the Jack Whacker in the old drinking horn. Actually, I wish I'd have kept the tape rolling because when I opened that, it sprayed everywhere in my uh, studio here. You probably got, <laughs> it's probably would have got a big kick out of that. Uh, hopefully, it didn't land on anything valuable. Anyway, uh, let me give this a smell. <sighs> That's pretty good. Got kind of a blueberry, uh, citrusy, kind of weedy smell going there. Let's give it a taste. Hmm. That's a <clears throat> nice flavor to this. You definitely tell, tell it's got a little lemongrass in it, I guess. Actually, it tastes a little bit more like a Greer plant uh, to me. <laughs> if you know that reference, you are a nerd. <laughs> All right, let's uh, try it one more time. Hmm. It's quite good. I, you know, I don't really know how to describe this. A little peachy. It's definitely a lighter uh, flavored ale. Um, not, not nearly as strong as those I've been trying uh, recently. And I guess I would go maybe two out of uh, five horns on this one. Uh, not, not a bad choice uh, if you want something light. Uh, unfortunately, I like something with a bit more flavor to it. So anyway, there you go, Jack Whacker. Be very careful when opening. All right, I'll leave you guys with a quotation. This is one I came up with a few weeks ago. I thought I would uh, share with you. And it goes uh, something like this. Mistakes are like poop. Sure, they stink. But anybody who says they don't make any is full of crap. See you guys next week. Is that uh, absolutely necessary? Or should it be him?
is. What did he say? He says, yeah, he's afraid it is. 